There's an intimate connection between butter and war, between domestic policy where we don't have enough money to deal with jobs with a living wage, don't have enough money to deal with housing, don't have enough money to deal with quality education. Why? Because out of every dollar, 53 cents already go to the military industrial complex. You got to sustain those 4,855 military bases and 587 bases in 42 nations and 140 special operations of U.S. forces around the world. There's only 190-some countries in the world. A lot of people say to me, Brother West, why do you use the language of empire? America's not an empire. Check yourself. <laughs> All empires don't look the same. I have to make a little confession. Part of me is up here tonight um, having a bit of a fanboy moment. As you can well imagine, Dr. West has been an inspiration for many years. I'm sure that's the case for all of you as well. Whether it be speaking, recording, marching, preaching, protesting, or giving Tracy Morgan some advice on 30 Rock, Dr. West is always an inspiration. I'm also inspired by his connections to incredible institutions, Union uh, Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, and my own alma mater, Princeton University. But it is not just about the fanboy in me. It is about how he challenges us. He has challenged us since the beginning of his career to resist, and that's a word that gets a lot of airplay these days. He's challenged us to resist complacency. Resist believing that we have it all figured out. Resist that we know it all. And resist the idea that we cannot continue to evolve and learn. And to resist labels. And so it is my immense pleasure, my giddy pleasure even, to welcome up here to teach us why race still matters, Dr. Cornell West. What an honor, what a privilege to be in this consecrated space. It was here that Ralph Waldo Emerson gave one of his most famous lectures, and it is here where I salute my dear brother, Reverend Adam Dyer. He comes from a family of spiritual nobility. His blessed mother, Ed Winner, graduate of Harvard Divinity School. She was a gem and a jewel. His grandfather from Hamilton, Canada, right outside of Toronto. Hamilton's a very, very special place, produced some high quality people. And McMaster University, where both his grandparents graduated. So give it up again for this young visionary leader. Class of Princeton University, 1987. I want to thank Sister Mary and Sister Jane. Where is Sister Jane, who's the president? Where is the president? Where is she? Where? There she is. Give it up for our dear sister here. Both of these civic leaders, this, this forum is not to be taken for granted. It's so very important that we have some high quality public spaces given the privatizing of nearly everything possible in our neoliberal regime. And the Cambridge Forum has a long and rich history of ensuring that our voices bounce up against one another. And I come from a people whose anthem is lift every voice. And those voices are requisite for any kind of democratic soul craft, any kind of democratic culture, let alone a full-fledged democratic experiment given the realities of empire and white supremacy and male supremacy and homophobia and transphobia and all of those different ideologies that lose sight of precious human beings, the anti-Jewish, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian, anti-Kurd. We can go on and on and on. Of course, I'm blessed to be part of the Beacon team, because Beacon Press is one of the great institutions in the history of this empire. Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. It was only Beacon 
that said, we'll make it available to our fellow citizens. Herbert Marcuse, James Baldwin, one can go on and on and on. And this particular text is just a very, very slight moment in the history of Beacon. And we're blessed to have the leaders of that Beacon Press. I want to salute my dear sister Helen, who was a publisher and leader. Next to her is my dear sister Gayatri, who's editor in chief. And where is brother Tom? Out there is brother Tom in the facilitator. Sitting next to him was my dear sister Pam, straight out of Providence, Rhode Island, but great tied to the Beacon family. And there's a new brother named Sarge. Did I get it right? Give it up for the Beacon team. Indeed, indeed. And I would not be standing here with this text if it were not for one visionary sister named Deb Chasman who came to my office in 1992 and said, I would like to have a book out of you. I said, I don't think so. And she looked on the floor of my office and saw an essay there and another essay there and another essay there and looked at all of them and said, I think we've got the makings of a book. I said, you don't say. <laughs> Coming out of Descent Magazine, American Prospect, Praxis International, a whole host of different journals. And there was only one new essay that I actually wrote on black sexuality. And so we got Sister Deb in. Give it up for Sister Deb. We salute you. 25, 26 years ago. And I salute each and every one of you. You can see I'm in no rush tonight. We were just here with my dear sister, towering intellectual that she is, Danielle Allen. And it was a rainy night, and the fire alarm went off, and we all had to exit the room. Now, let's hope and pray that doesn't happen tonight, but, but if it does, I'm ready for the exit and ready for the reentry, because I'm here for some serious dialogue, given the seriousness of our subject matter. And I begin actually on a very different note in most discourses about race. I begin with an acknowledgement that we live in a nation that's been shaped by a vicious legacy of white supremacy, but there is no white supremacy without resistance to white supremacy. And I am who I am because somebody loved me, somebody cared for me, somebody attended to me. So in the face of white supremacist attack, Black hope, a joke. Black freedom, a pipe dream. Black history, a curse. Black love, a crime. That I'm a product of that black love. That I'll never be the, the human being my mother and father. The highest honor I've ever received is to be the second son of Irene and Clifton West. To come out of Shiloh Baptist Church to Reverend Willie P. Cook. In those days, we had pastors, not CEOs. The market model hadn't taken over the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and other civic institutions, including the universities with the corporatizing and marketizing, commodifying of our universities. No, I come out of a tradition of a flawed people, but a people who have been serious about confronting the hatred of white supremacy and yet teaching the world so much about how to love. That's what John Coltrane's Love Supreme is all about. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On and the love-soaked essays of James Ball and Toni Morrison, Nina Simone. These are not icons to be invoked. They are constitutive features of a tradition that is shot through my heart, mind, and soul. So I begin with prophetic fight back, given the spiritual blackout. Now, what is spiritual blackout? What is the relative eclipse of integrity, honesty, decency, and generosity in our culture is shot through every institution, every site, every sphere. When you talk about race matters, you're only talking about a particular tradition that's trying to reinforce the spiritual blackout. 
but we live not just in a democratic experiment, but we live in an empire. And that empire is in deep spiritual decay and relative decline. And when I talk about spiritual blackout, I'm talking about one, the normalizing of mendacity. Well, lies are viewed as the normal way of life. And I'm not just talking about a gangster at the top named Brother Donald Trump. That's too easy. He's not isolated. He's not alien. He's not extraneous to the American experiment. He is as American as apple pie. He just happens to be the worst of the American experiment. But he's not all by himself, and that's very important because the last thing we need is to think that all we need to do is extricate some isolated individual, and lo and behold, we're able to get back to business as usual. No, business as usual already normalized mendacity. As I recall, it was Brennan that said, yes, we have drone strikes, and they have not killed one civilian. Quit lying. Yes, Wall Street is, in fact, accountable. We're going to ensure that the rule of law rules. Quit lying. No Wall Street executive went to jail. We know that given that massive criminality of market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, and predatory lending. Lies, lies, lies. And when you normalize mendacity, you naturalize criminality. So that we, what used to be crimes against humanity, lo and behold, become business as usual. 22% of America's children living under poverty in the richest nation of the world, that's a crime against humanity. The top three individuals in America have wealth equivalent to the bottom 160 million fellow citizens. 50% of Americans have wealth equivalent to the top three brothers. That's a crime against you. Now, why use that hyperbolic language? Precisely because that level of grotesque wealth inequality generates forms of wounds and scars and bruises, unbelievable forms of terror and trauma, psychic as well as physical. And where are the righteous indignation expressions? Where are the voices? That's what it means to deal with to have to come to terms with spiritual blackout. Now, thank God we've got our dear brother William Barber II. Oh, thank God for the Poor People's Campaign. Trying to raise the voices. Thank God for Reverend Liz the O'Harris. They had the opening of the campaign just yesterday in what used to be a chocolate city named Washington, D.C. before gentrification set in trying to keep alive what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love. A love of truth and condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And a love of goodness that keeps track of evil, of undeserved suffering and unwarranted pain. And a love of beauty. There's no love of beauty without wrestling with terror as Rilke and the other poets remind us. And I stand also as a revolutionary Christian. So I'm really old school, Brother Dyer. I'm glad your church is next to a cemetery. I appreciate that. Because <laughs> that's the sign of any, any mature view of the world. We refuse to deny time, history, and death. We got to work through time and work through history and work through the forms of a death, and for my tradition, and the people that produced me, it was 244 years of social death, of slavery, that's race matters, that's where it begins in the modern U.S. history. Against the law for black people to learn how to read and write. Against the law for black people to worship God without white supervision in the beacon of religious liberty. That's just not a tension between practices and principles. That is sheer mendacity, hypocrisy, and criminality. We got to call it for what it is. And then Jim Crow, a civic death of terror and trauma and every two and a half days for 50 years, some black body swinging from some tree that 
Billie Holiday sang about with such power and strange fruits, the southern trees bear, and the Jewish brother Maripol writing those magnificent lyrics. Then after Jim Crow, here comes Jim Crow Jr. Hyper incarceration regime, massive unemployment and underemployment, decrepit schools, indecent housing, guns and drugs shot through working class and poor neighborhoods, disproportionately chocolate, black, brown, and red, but deeply affecting our white brothers and sisters too, and even our fellow conservative, libertarian, crypto reactionary brother Charles Murray tells the truth in coming apart, that our white brothers and sisters in Appalachia who are as precious like anybody else catching hell given the predatory capitalist civilization in which they find themselves. Spiritual blackout. The rewarding of callousness and the encouragement of indifference. Great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself. Indifference to evil. You create whole ways of life that generate an indifference toward people who are suffering. And I take very seriously the legacy of Jerusalem that begins with our precious Jewish brothers and sisters that say, the spreading of hesed, of loving kindness to the orphan and the widow, the fatherless and motherless, the weak and the vulnerable, that's the lens through which you view any society. Amos, you are absolutely right. Isaiah, you're right. Jeremiah, you're right. Martin King, you're right. Grace Boggs, secular Marxist sister, gives a nice little twist to that legacy of Jerusalem. No cognitive commitment to God talk, but fundamental commitment to spreading justice to the vulnerable. And we know our secular brothers and sisters have so much to give and so much to add to any serious talk about highlighting the plight of the most vulnerable of those friends for known called the wretched of the earth. Now, of course, we could begin to talk about the tax bill. We can begin to talk about Trump's public policies and the ways in which it reinforces callousness, reinforces indifference, reinforces grotesque wealth inequality, turns its back on the weak and the vulnerable. But we're trying to deal first with ourselves before we engage in the critique of others. It's too easy to jump to name calling and finger pointing, given the example of a Donald Trump, who is a sign and a symptom of an American empire shot through with callousness and indifference, with mendacity and criminality. All spectacle, no substance. All greed and appetite, no wisdom and maturity obsessed with the fetishes, the idols of our day, which are what? Smartness, riches, and bombs. You can call it neoliberal soul craft. That's the end and aim of life is to be the smartest in the room and the richest in the room and the most powerful with military might in the room, and you end up fetishizing, ascribing magical power to smartness and downplaying wisdom, downplaying courage, downplaying compassion. It's got to be the richest in the room. It's no accident Donald Trump has got to be the smartest and the richest everywhere he goes. This is nothing but a sign of profound insecurity, self-deception, self-deceit, and yet somehow able to convince enough of our fellow citizens that he belongs in the White House. He did win, given the Electoral College. That's not a moment for self-flagellation. That's a moment for self-reflection and self-criticism. 43% of our fellow citizens didn't even vote and don't care. 25% 
voted for the gangster. And I say gangster because that's, that's an objective condition, not a subjective expression. Very important point. Very important point. So, oh, Brother West, why are you calling the president a gangster? That just shows your partisanship and your bias. No, anybody who talks about grabbing a woman's private parts a gangster, anybody that's talking about stealing somebody else's oil of another country, that's gangster activity. That's objective, empirical evidence that allows us to infer he's a gangster. He's a gangster. And I'm not saying something about him that I'm not saying about myself. I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> I grew up with gangsters. And there's a whole lot of gangster in me. So this is not a question of somehow pointing my finger at some alien from another planet. It's part of the civil war that's raging on inside of each and every one of us, of being cold and callous and indifferent and arrogant and haughty, looking down on the suffering of others, insensitive to the hurt of others. And the result is what? Slow emergence, stirring, and expression of neo-fascist sensibilities. The unleashing of hate and contempt our precious Mexican brothers and sisters, immigrants across the board, Muslims across the board, Jews. It used to be traditionally it was Catholics. Now you got the head of the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke, he's a Catholic. That's American upward mobility. <laughs> Pretty soon there'll be a Negro running things. When I was in Charlottesville with them right up in our faces and cussing and spitting and carrying on, I saw a Negro marching with the neo-Nazis. I said, that's a confused mother, shut your mouth. <laughs> but that shows that we're all human. Never function of skin pigmentation. Never function of gender or sexual orientation. Never function of national identity. All of that identity X and Y is always undercut in terms of our humanity and what kind of choices we make in regard to what kind of virtues and vices we decide to enact before the worms get our bodies. That's a crucial challenge for each and every one of us. That's race matters in the 21st century. So it is with that tradition of critique and resistance of which I'm just a small moment. It's the blues people. And the blues is always about catastrophe lyrically expressed. Nobody loves me but my mom and she might be jiving too. <laughs> that's the king of the blues, that's B.B. King. And that's the B-side to the thrill is gone. <laughs> but it's catastrophe. Well, to talk about race matters is to talk about earth matters. The Anthropocene age in which we live, in which human activity now is a fundamental feature of the capacity to bring the species to a close. And it's tied to unaccountable corporate power. It's tied to predatory capitalist orientation. It's tied to fellow citizens acting as if or denying the impending ecological catastrophe that is headed our way. Tied to nuclear catastrophe. It's not just North Korea and the United States at the moment, but there's a whole host of other countries that have the capacity to bring the human experiment to a close. It's the civic catastrophe, thank God again for Cambridge Forum, in which the very notion of publicness, public health, public education, public transportation, public conversation are pushed to the margins. We've lost the very capacity to learn how to listen from one another, learn how to engage in dialogue in public space, entering that space without humiliation and respecting each other. I was just blessed to be 
in dialogue with my dear brother Robbie George at Princeton University just, just on Sunday for a C-SPAN for three hours. I don't know how anybody could watch anybody for three hours, but my mama did. <laughs> she loves me <laughs> deeply. But he's a right-wing brother. I'm left-wing brother. We struggle over issues, push each other against the wall, but we can still argue in public because there's something bigger than each and every one of us. It's called democracy. It's called freedom. It's called liberty. It's called equality. It's called wrestling with forms of oppression. It's called sweetness. It's called kindness. It's called gentleness. All of those most worthwhile things that are bigger than each and every one of us. And when you lose the value of publicness, John Dewey understood this. We got one of the finest political theorists of his generation here, and Brother Brandon Terry, got a magnificent book on the way out, Tragic Vision of Civil Rights Movement. But he understands John Dewey in that classic of 1927, the public and its problems. And show me a democracy that loses its understanding of publicness. And Dewey said, I'll show you a democracy that is so thoroughly privatized that it is on the way to a Hobbesian war of all against all. Tribalism down the road, already here. Coercion, violence, and of course with the wave of the sexual harassment cases that we've seen, so many of the insecure male brothers deploying arbitrary power because that's what it is. It's not so much about pleasure, it's about power. Asymmetric relation of domination. And finally, some accountability, finally some answerability, finally some responsibility has to be taken seriously. Again, a sign and symptom of those at the top thinking they can do anything, say anything, and get away with it because callousness and indifference has become dominant ways of life. As long as you're smart and you're rich and as long as you have the military might to bomb. My dear brother Barack Obama wins the Nobel Peace Prize but drops 26,171 bombs in one year in 2016. 550 Palestinian babies are killed in 51 days and not one public official can say a mumbling word. That's a nadir, the low point. We ought to have the same righteous indignation of those with precious Jewish babies because a Palestinian baby has exactly the same significance as a Jewish baby and a Jewish baby has exactly the same significance as a Palestinian baby. It can't be just a question of military might. Where's your morality? Where is your spirituality? I could hear even David Ben-Gurion, who I have deep critiques of, when he founded the State of Israel, what did he say? The State of Israel proves itself not by its military might, not by its material wealth, not by its technical achievement, but by its moral character and its human values. Brother David is right. The question then becomes, where are the moral and spiritual voices that try to render accountable those who have military might that would result in the killing of any innocent people, be they precious Jewish babies in Tel Aviv or be they precious Palestinian babies in Gaza? That's part of our challenge. And don't think, as Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us right before he died, don't think that bombs and drone strikes dropped in Yemen, in Somalia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, don't also land in the United States. There's an intimate connection between butter and war, between domestic policy where we don't have enough money to deal with jobs with a living wage, don't have enough money to deal with housing, don't have enough money to deal with quality education. Why? Because out of every dollar, 53 cents already go to the military industrial complex. You got to sustain those 4,855 military 
bases and 587 bases in 42 nations and 140 special operations of U.S. forces around the world. There's only 190-some countries in the world. A lot of people tell me, Brother West, why do you use the language of empire? America's not an empire. Check yourself. <laughs> All empires don't look the same. The British Empire was different than the French, different from the Belgium, different than the German. Even the Italians tried to get in on empire, but the Ethiopians pushed them back, didn't they? In the Battle of Adewa. Thank God for Menelik. But no, America's been an empire since 1945. The permanent war economy. Thank God for Noam Chomsky and John Dower. Thank God for William Appleton Williams' his great book, America. The empire is a way of life. Thank God by the recent book of Alfred McCoy in the shadows of the American century. And what does it mean to be an empire? It means, like all empires, the worst is always hubris, machismo identity, thinking that you're never accountable to your victims. That I could hear Malcolm X saying, chickens come home to roost, you know. Sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow. And you can lose your soul by thinking that somehow those imperial policies around the world don't come back to haunt your mind, heart, and soul, your memory when it comes to domestic policy. And that's why prophetic fight back is so crucial. I'm going to bring this to a close, and I want to have a good time for dialogue and call and response. But I believe that the black freedom struggle, and this is why I struggle with my dear brother Coates and a host of other young black intellectuals who I'm excited to, to hear what they have to say and the voices that they put forward and so on. But I want to always check and see whether they're true to the best of what black people have given the world. Have you wrestled with Du Bois? Have you wrestled with C.L. James, C.L.R. James? Have you come to terms with the vision of Ella Baker? They didn't live for nothing. And the greatest contributions of black activists has been a spiritual and moral fortitude. And by fortitude, I mean the fusion of courage and magnanimity. Courage in and of itself is not enough. You can be a Nazi soldier and be courageous and still be a gangster and a thug. But when you're courageous and you have greatness of character, that's something else. That's Frederick Douglass. That's Ida B. Wells Barnett. That's A. Philip Randolph. And for them, the standard was always set by black musicians, by the black musical tradition. And unfortunately, black music has been viewed as some kind of narrow form of entertainment rather than a deeper form of paideia, of soul formation, in which you're able to look hatred in the face and steal love. You're able to look oppression in the face and not want to oppress others. You can look terrorism in the face and not want to terrorize others. That's what the spirituals are all about. That's what the blues are all about. That's what you hear in the Ray Charles what you hear in the Luther Vandross. You hear the transfiguring of suffering, wrestling with tear and trauma, and giving the world unbelievable, magnanimous sound, majestic sound, and in that sound, you are able to experience a love that connects to your human soul, even given the structures of domination which are in place. And when the black freedom tradition and the black musical tradition experiences spiritual blackout, you can rest be assured that we're at the near end of the American experiment as we understand it. What do you mean, Brother West? Well, look at it this way. If black people had decided to terrorize white brothers and sisters the way white brothers and sisters terrorized black people. Every generation had been a civil war. 
If black people had decided to be black versions of the Ku Klux Klan, or black versions of ISIS, or black versions of Al Qaeda, so you had black terrorist cells all over every city, there would be an authoritarian crypto fascist America a long time ago. If black people had produced terrorists rather than Frederick Douglass and terrorists rather than Martin Luther King Jr. and terrorists rather than Ella Baker, there would be no democratic experiment whatsoever. Let's be honest about it. That's why I tell my white brothers and sisters, when you see Negroes, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for Ray Charles. Thank you for Curtis Mayfield. Thank you for Aretha Franklin. Think where you come from, why you keep producing these love warriors in the face of so much hatred. They don't fall from the sky, they come out of strong families and churches and civic associations. Where does a Muhammad Ali come from? We Christians have no monopoly on it. How come he got that kind of love? How come he's got that kind of courage and fortitude in such a way that even when he's knocking folk out, he still got love in his heart. And when it's time to give up the belt, in the name of a refusal to engage in an American imperial war, he said, take the belt. I got to love deeper than this belt. That's the tradition I'm talking about. And without that tradition, that's the leaven in the American democratic loaf. And when you lose that, it is about over. And I'm not saying black people have any monopoly on truth or goodness or beauty. I'm just saying that we black folk in the making of the United States have disproportionately contributed to the democratic expansion owing to the spiritual fortitude and the unbelievable moral orientations of a hated and haunted and hounded people. And we didn't have to do it. Could have gone gangster. Could have gone terrorist. Could have gone with hate. Could have gone with envy. Could have gone resentment. We have all of those elements in the black tradition, but the major black spokespeople, and especially the musicians, said no. Charlie Parker in Cherokee said no. Listen to this. Full of rage, but it's going to put some fire in your soul. I know it's a European instrument created by Adolf Sachs, but I'm going to play this in such a way that no white man played a European instrument. Listen to this. That spiritual fortitude, as well as, in his case, artistic genius. And every jazz musician is not a genius. We know that. Where are we today? Black freedom movement in very deep trouble, with the exception of the younger generation, not just black, but across race. Sign of hope, the movement for black lives multi-racial, led disproportionately by our precious gay, lesbian, trans, queer brothers and sisters. Very different than the 60s, building on the 60s. Standing Rock, our indigenous brothers and sisters coming together. Echoes of Sitting Bull, going back to Wounded Knee. Immigrant movement, Mexicans, and whole host of others bringing critique to bear on an indifference toward those who come across the border. And of course, when they come into Texas and California, which used to be Mexico, they're coming home in a certain sense. We know it was stolen from Mexico, thank God, for Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and others who led the charge against that dirty war that Ulysses S. Grant called and, and stealing Mexican land. That's part of the imperial expansion internally in the making of the nation, what Bernard de Voto called the course of empire in the 1950s. He wrote that book, Echoes of Mark Twain, one of the great critics of American imperialism, of course, the greatest of all American novelists and critique of empire, Herman Melville himself. Harvard didn't produce Melville. I always remind Harvard of that. <laughs> Harvard produced some wonderful folk, but they didn't produce the greatest novelists. Not at all. Didn't go to college, but the college went through him. Crucial. Bring this to a close. Where are we now? Neo-fascist elites. Rule of big money. Big military. More and more fellow citizens feeling helpless, 
impotent, even hopeless. How do you generate some sense of possibility? It's only by example. Woman's movement, January, masses hit the street. Beautiful in many ways. Woman's movement in March, masses hit the street in the name of feminism, but not a top-down corporate liberal feminism, but a feminism of trans, queer, poor, white women, black women, brown women, and bottoms-up feminism. Not that neoliberal feminism of leaning in. <laughs> no, no, we're not leaning in. What's our dear sister's name? Cheryl something something? What is it? Sandberg. San Sandberg. Y'all know the name. No, no, we're not leaning in. Mm -mm, we're coming in swinging. <laughs> we're coming in swinging. Bottoms up. We love our professional women. They're human like anybody else, but they don't have a monopoly on feminism. They don't have a monopoly on conceptions of how women ought to affirm their dignity and engage in up with mobility. We got to talk about empire. You got to talk about women in Somalia, women in Ethiopia, women in Guatemala. This is an international, it's a cosmopolitan orientation. It goes all the way back to the towering prophets of Hebrew scripture. It was the nations with an S that Amos talked about. He didn't have to get to Christianity for universalism. It was already there in Judaism. The deep concern, do we have a chance or is it too late to deal with our catastrophes, the economic catastrophe of grotesque wealth inequality and the political catastrophe of not just a dysfunctional government but the oligarchs and the plutocrats ruling things. And when it comes to the black musical tradition, the oligarchs who control recording, video, live performance, only concerned about certain kinds of voices. No group performers anymore. Just all isolated, monadic individuals with microphones, many just running their mouths, reinforcing stereotypes, keeping it real by reinforcing corporate advertisements of hedonism and narcissism and acting as if they so big and bad. The distinctive feature of neoliberal soul craft is the pose and posture as if you're so concerned about something bigger than you, but in the end, it's fundamentally about you making money, gaining access to raw power, ambition, and self-promotion. And that's true in the academy as well. It's hard in the academy these days to find folk who are fundamentally in love with the life of the mind as opposed to that next promotion, that next tenure, that next visibility. All we see is so about image, spectacle, status, position. That's the superficial things. What are you fundamentally willing to risk your life for? What kind of costs are you willing to pay? What kind of death are you willing to undergo? That's the question of any struggle for freedom. If you don't have people who can answer that question, all the rest of it is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And that's where we are today. And we have to remind ourselves what the Greeks would call arate, the highest levels of spiritual and moral excellence. No matter how difficult those standards are, they are still there, and that's true for any tradition. The Catholics got to deal with Dorothy Day. Jewish folk got to deal with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. The Buddhists got to deal with bell hooks. The Hindus got to deal with Gandhi. The Buddhists have to come to terms with Ann Becker, that great Dalit freedom fighter. The feminist movement has to come to terms with Murray Rukeyser and Alice Walker. The anti-homophobic movement has to come to terms with the James Baldwin's and the Audre Lords and the Tennessee Williams and the Stephen Sondheims. They set the highest standards. What a challenge. At this point, it's a matter of trying to tell the truth, bearing witness, and in the end, not talking about hope. I think there ought to be a moratorium on talk about hope. 
It's been so colonized, domesticated, sanitized, and sterilized, I don't even want to hear the word anymore. If I wasn't a Christian, I'm tied into the word. As a virtue of my own religious sensibility, I don't like the word. I'm like Thucydides in the Million Dialogue. Hope is what? It's dangerous comfort that leaves you ill-equipped and it leads towards self-destruction. That's our pagan brothers and sisters about hope. You don't get valorizing a hope until you move to Jerusalem. And I understand what Thucydides was talking about, I understand why Nietzsche fell in love with Thucydides' his deep suspicion of hope. But I'm tied to hope in terms of being a hope, being in motion, putting your body on the line, engaging in forms of soul craft. You're willing, in fact, to go to the edge of your own limits and see what's there, to step out on nothing and land on something. That's the people I come from. Be in a hope. Curtis Mayfield said, keep on pushing. That's not an abstract dialogue on hope. That's an existential enactment and embodiment of it. So when people see you, they can see, lo and behold, there goes a truth teller. There goes a witness bear. I learned it in vacation Bible school. I was told if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. That's not an abstract discourse about hope. That's being a hope. And do we have what it takes? Open question. Every generation has to answer that question. 1930s, it didn't look good. 1950s, hysteria, McCarthyism, it didn't look good. 1890s, robber barons taking over, it didn't look good. 1860s, thank God for our statue right in front of this church, Brother Charles Sumner and the others fighting, getting beat up by other congressmen. It didn't look good. So it is with us. It does not look good. Who's willing to be a hope to build on the best of the truth tellers and witness bearers of the past and present? We shall see. Thank you all so very much. And I'm going to start us off with one quick question, sure. if I may. Absolutely. So you spoke a lot about um, black artists, black musicians yeah. specifically. I'm wondering if you might be able to share a little bit of a reflection on what it means to see so much black art co-opted in this time. Well, not just this time. It goes back from the very beginning. Of course, minstrels was the first mass entertainment for the American popular culture. There's always been this fascination with black creativity, talent, and even genius. Uh, but these days, of course, where all art is so thoroughly commodified and marketized and commercialized, uh, that is no accident that when it's very much like athletics the same way, when it comes to who will perform for us you try out the folk who are going to generate the biggest crowds and make sure you pay them the money with the profits going to the top and the performers passing by, getting various wages. Some of them big wages. You know, Jay-Z is not part of the, the, uh, the lumping proletariat. You know what I mean? <laughs> that Negro got a lot of money. You know what I mean? And his wife, too. And both of them are towering artistic figures. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, um, in both cases, and there's a fascinating interview I just read of Jay-Z in the New York Times Style magazine where he's wrestling with his success. It reminds me of a lot of these CEOs these days in Silicon Valley talking about the spiritual emptiness given the uh, million dollar yachts that they spend time on. Uh, uh, the, this issue of wrestling with unbelievable talent commodified and what happens to calling vocation what happens to courage, what happens to resistance. Genuine courage and resistance, not the semblance, not the simulacra, not the copy, but what Ashwin and Simpson would call the real thing. The real thing, yes indeed. And I think, my, come right to the microphone, my brother. Brother, it's an honor to be in your presence, but you get behind that microphone, we can hear every word of your precious voice, so brother. Hi, my name is Dwayne Callender, and yeah. I'm a Cantavidian. I've been here over 50 years. And as many times as you come to the forum, I always miss it. But today, thank you, Jesus. Oh. So I have a two-part question. First, sure. I, I wonder what your take is on civil rights. How do you feel about it from then until today? And my second is, 
Who taught you math? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the president of But no, when you talk about civil rights, though, first let's just be very clear about the progress that we've made, which is to say the, the very end and aim of trying to get black people to be citizens in America was an unbelievable struggle, it was a bloody struggle of unbelievable sweat and tears. So just to be able to gain the right to vote, just to gain, be able to right to live in certain neighborhoods, just to be able to get, gain the right to eat in certain restaurants, that took generations. But that was not enough. That was not enough. Why? Because in a capitalist society, most of your wealth is still on the top. 1% of the population owns 41% of the wealth. The educational system still is governed by laws that make it difficult for poor children to gain the quality education that well-to-do children gain, and especially at the job market, the labor force. So the civil rights breakthrough, yes, crucial, but not enough. Like Malcolm X said. You don't stab folk in the back nine inches, pull it out six inches, and celebrate your progress. Amen. Amen. See what I mean? Yes. So that the struggle does go. Do we acknowledge the relative progress in that? In terms of who taught me, brother, I'm still learning. Amen. Oh, I'm still learning. You pray for me, I'm praying for you. All right. All right. Love you, though, brother. Love you, though, man. Definitely. Go right ahead. Thank you, Dr. West. Um, you that so was much. very prophetic. Um, but in the matters of prophecy, I have to say that when you talk about normalization of mendacity, yeah. um, I would say that mendacity is venerated through the theological tradition, through the theological canon. The moment that God authorizes the firstborn, the killing of the firstborn of every Egyptian in Exodus, if we actually invoke that paradigm, how can we even critique Obama for dropping those bombs? How can we critique feminism and the way it is right now in a neocolonial world, but actually have two accounts of Eve yeah. where Eve is made complicit in the fall, That's where true. Hagar is treated the way she is by Sarah in the Bible? Right? And I'm talking about how is it that the canonical theologies have been canonized? You know, Derrida would say in, you know, the archon created, yeah. um, legislated them into a canon. So how is it that we can actually invoke that archetype, the embedded archetype in theology that is so unequal? Yeah. And yet, um, how do we fight that superstructure? Ooh, what a powerful question, my dear sister. I salute you, salute you. Good God. We need a couple of seminars to come to terms with that deep question. And keep in mind now, you see, I come from a Christian tradition uh, whose very church is founded on the bones of a liar named Peter. Lied three times. Denied Jesus. Weren't you with him? No, no, I never knew the brother. I don't know. That wasn't me. He looked just like him. No, no, that wasn't me. Oh, no, 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 no. Three times he lied. But he becomes the foundation of the church. What does that mean? Lower your expectations of the church. I wouldn't take that for an answer. No, no, this is not an answer. I'm just beginning. No, this is not an answer. Mendacity, criminality has been shot through religious traditions across the board. Look at the Christian treatment of our precious Jewish brothers and sisters. So much hate, contempt, inquisition, murder, pogroms, and so forth and so on. Christian treatment of Muslims, Christian treatments of our precious gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans. The hatred and contempt that I'm talking about is shot through the very tradition. This is true. I would argue with secular traditions, too, beginning with a gangster named Stalin. You see? So the question becomes, how do we tease out of these traditions where mendacity has played such an important role to be as critical of these traditions as we are of our politicians, the Trumps or anybody else, the Obamas, the Putins, the CCs, whatever it is, wherever it, one finds oneself. The neo-fascists in Hungary, and Turkey, Kenya, and so forth and so on. So that one has to be very, very intellectually honest and subtle to be able to tease out the critique of mendacity and not assume that any tradition has been free of mendacity. No, you're absolutely right. And of course, patriarchy is set at the center of most of the historic world traditions that we know, Judaism, Christianity, 
Islam and must be radically called into question. It's just that some of us have the audacity to believe we can engage in critiques of patriarchy and so forth and remain on the edges of these religious traditions. And that's where the dialogue takes place. That's the beginning of an answer to your powerful question, though. But thank you so much. <laughs> My right, um, dear brother, how you doing today? Good, good you. To see you. It's a nice hat you got there too. <laughs> Mr. Though, West, it seems to be a fitting forum to raise an issue of injustice. Yes. And with your permission, I'll be very quick. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Kaveh Afra Siabi. I'm the author of many books, including Looking for Rights at Harvard. We can look it up on Amazon, etc. I was subjected to a false arrest by Harvard police, I spent time in jail, was exonerated. Mm filed a civil rights lawsuit against Harvard, 10-day jury trial where historian Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, Mike Wallace, David Mamet were among the people who testified on my behalf. I lost narrowly five to four in the US Supreme Court and I have the distinction of being the only person acting as my own attorney to have taken Harvard University to the US Supreme Court, passed the writ of certiorari and lost five to four all the Harvard-connected Supreme Court judges voted against me. I'm still banned from Harvard after all these years, despite the fact that I was fully exonerated of any wrongdoing. I'm published by Harvard University Press, Harvard Theological Review, Harvard International Review, and the list goes on. And I'm here to use this occasion to alert this audience, some of you high-brought Harvard scholars and so forth, to look up my book, to read it and to see the grave injustice that has been perpetrated against me years after years. I've had to endure years of being blacklisted by the long tentacles of Harvard University, and I've mm. fought them with, with bravery and so forth. And as I said, historian, late historian Excuse Howard Zinn. Do you have a question? Was it, mention the title of your book again, Obama? Looking for Rights at Harvard. Looking for Rights at Harvard. At and okay. still not finding it after still all these it. years. Well, you are welcome to come to my office, though, brother. I shall. Absolutely. Thank indeed, you. Indeed, indeed, indeed. But no, I'm glad you had a chance to lay bare your, we're going to read your text and so forth. Definitely. Very much so. No, oh, God bless you too. Right ahead, my dear sister. Hi, Dr. West. It is such a privilege to be in your presence. My name is Lynette Fasthorse, and I'm a Hunkpapa Lakota and an enrolled member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. A year ago today, a year ago yesterday, December 4th, the Army Corps of Engineers denied the permit for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And you were at Standing Rock, and, and that meant the world to me, to my people. So thank you. My question is, what are your thoughts now that a year's gone by and going into the future in light of the recent downsizing of the two national monuments in Utah yes, exactly. in terms of my people and again, the US government. I just wanted to sh hear your thoughts on that to, from a year ago and then going forward. Yeah, well, Thank one, you. I want to salute you, I salute your work, salute your witness, salute the prophetic elements of your very, very rich tradition. We all trying to hold on to those prophetic elements in our respective traditions. And you know how blessed I was to be there at Standing Rock. Uh, one of the first things I do usually when I go into context that I know so little of is I try to go in with a certain kind of humility in order to learn and listen from the voices that have been engaged in struggles for so long. And so my, my first instinct is to try to listen to the voices that are trying to regroup and reconsolidate given the kind of neo-fascist sensibilities they see coming from the White House, the public bureaucracies, the unbelievable attacks on ecological integrity, and in this case, on sacred lands, which is to say the self-respect of precious indigenous brothers and sisters. So I want to be part of the kind of solidarity work in which that rethinking and renewing of forms of insurgency and resistance take place. And when the call goes out, I plan to be there again. I can't wait to go back. That was one of the great experiences, life transforming experience for me to see all of the nations, or so many of the nations coming together, which themselves have histories of conflict and what have you. 
And you know how rich the spirit, you know how rich the community was, but we knew that this was gonna be a setback with the neo-fascist catastrophe that Trump represented. And uh, our dear sister Hillary Clinton representing a neo-liberal disaster, and it was tough to choose between a disaster and a catastrophe. <laughs> Neoliberal catastrophe it certainly is better than a neo-fascist catastrophe. We know that in terms of rights of the weak and women and so forth and so on. But when it comes to military industrial complex, when it comes to imperial policies, when it comes to military coups in Honduras, when it comes to Israeli occupation of Palestinians, lands and peoples and so forth, the neoliberals and the neo-fascists tend to come together. The night raids of our poor brothers and sisters in Muslim countries, the bombing of the five, six Muslim countries for over 14 straight years in a row with no serious opposition from either camp. That was part and parcel of what we were dealing with. And now we've got the catastrophe and it is very real and concrete. And I simply want to say that uh, Luta continue on. This struggle will continue with all of the different forces, Naomi Klein, Ben and Bob Mc given all of the ecological activists with indigenous peoples. We needed more black folk out there, but we had some. We're going to get more brown so that the immigrant movement can be connected to the concerns of indigenous peoples, plight and, and predicament. It's a profoundly human affair. And that's what we experience in Standing Rock. But you stay strong. Thank stay you. strong, my dear sister. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. short for me. How you doing, my brother? No, you speak right into that mic, though. Man. Okay. There you go. Um, I'm very much connected to what you said about our culture of worshiping three things in particular, power, intelligence, and the third one was, I'm spacing One of those out. bombs, maybe. No, no, no. It wasn't that, that was one the power. Now, huh? Oh, rich, richness? Wealth. Wealth, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Wealth intelligence well, and it was power. Smart, it was smartness well, rather than intelligence, though. You remember that? You remember that? We want to make a distinction between well, smartness and intelligence. So what I but see... Go, go right ahead, though. Uh -huh. What I see currently is yeah. that all of this is coming to a head in the way men are treating women. And that the way... Th there's a lot of sort of reckoning with... How are we educating men to, def you know, how, how they think of themselves as men? And what I see is that they see themselves as men through those three things. Mm. Wealth, intelligence, and power or prowess, you might call mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how we can move to a culture, this is maybe old school, I guess, where men are defined as such by their honor. That was a word we didn't hear in the presidential debates. Um, specifically towards women. No, oh, I appreciate that question, my brother. Well, one, I think in the end, all we have to go on are examples. Moral and spiritual examples. Emmanuel Kant said, examples of the go kart of judgment. Most of the most visible examples are market driven celebrities obsessed with glitz, status, spectacle, and image. We need moral and spiritual exemplars, not just in terms of individuals, in terms of movements, communities, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples. And so once the examples, if for example, a man who is fundamentally committed to eliminating patriarchy in his own heart, mind, and soul, and in the society becomes a highly attractive example, that's morally laden. That's not just market driven. You see. We need more men who turn to that example and say, ah, that's what inspires me, not the market-driven celebrity who exercises power tied to pleasure. And you end up, of course, what's one of the great ironies of our culture is that uh, so much of our culture is a joyless quest for insatiable pleasure. 
to get all the pleasure you want in the world and you're still empty, you're still vacuous because there's no joy. And joy is qualitatively different than pleasure. And joy in telling the truth, joy in struggle, joy in kindness, joy in trying to be sensitive, joy in being surrendering and service oriented. That's what's required. And let's just be honest about it. Most of the history of the species is the history of domination, exploitation, hatred, and contempt. All we're trying to do every generation is create a disruption or an interruption, a rupture to create some possibilities for something other than domination, genuine democracy, something other than just violence and force. Dialogue came before. See what I mean? Something other than hatred, a hug, or a grin, or a smile that has spiritual substance to it. That's the best we do as a species. And lo and behold, every generation has a muster that moral fiber and that courage to do it, that fortitude to do it. Because if not, the dominant ways of the world take over. And the dominant ways of the world have always been what we see in Plato's Republic, Thrasymachus. Might makes right. Life as a gold rush, worshiping the golden calf. But the golden rule becomes he who has the gold will rule. That's not what Hebrew scripture had in mind in the critique of the golden calf. Unleashing the prophetic possibility. That's what we're about. I love your question. But it's, the answer to your question is a life to be lived. It's not just propositions to utter. And that's a challenge to each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, though, brother. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. I'm going to be a little shorter, because I want to save time for signing books for anybody who so chooses, though. Absolutely. Go right ahead, my brother. Dr. West, uh, my name is Rob Kanzer. I'm a student of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, author of Nonviolent Communication, mm. The Language of Life. And I just wanted to give a special shout out, even though he's passed away. Mm, God bless him. In nonviolent communication, we learn that no matter what somebody does or says, or what they don't do or they mm -hmm. don't say, mm -hmm. there are two states. There's their emotions and their needs. If their needs are not being met, they have so-called negative emotions. And if we have positive emotions, let's say joy, like I feel being with you. Yeah. And I feel be being with you. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. It's because my needs are being met. The need to be engaged. Mm. So in addition to a shout out to my late teacher who brought about a temporary ceasefire in Sierra Leone by getting people to talk to each other in this language he calls nonviolent communication, NVC. My question is, what do you do personally when you feel like I think we all do sometimes, overwhelmed or discouraged? What activity do you do to refresh yourself so that you can get up and do what you do? Mm. Well, first let's salute Brother Marshall. Let's give it up for Brother Marshall. <laughs> yes, introduce this student here. But I do a whole lot of things, though, brother. Not just one thing. You know, some of them godly, some of them not too godly. But I, I do a whole lot of things. <laughs> Sometimes I may drink some cognac in the name of Jesus because I'm feeling down and out. You know what I mean? But I don't go to the crack house. I'm just drinking cognac, right? I, I, I'm with you. I'm with Other you. Other times I call my mama. You know, 86 years young, I'll never be mm -hmm. half the person she is. She got something to say. I call my brother. I call my loved ones. And, 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 and so forth. Other times I'll talk to Brother Brandon and Tommy Shelby and Brother Skip and others. I have friends that I can engage in very serious, risk ridden, vulnerable conversations so we can be real with each other and be absolutely. So there's a number of things. Sometimes I just turn on some John Coltrane and Curtis Mayfield uh, or, or, or Aretha Franklin or the dramatics or whatever. I mean, whatever is that context relative to 
my need to come to terms with, with despair. I think that uh, to have despair is a compliment. It's a sign of sensitivity. You know, when Goethe used to say, he or she who was never despaired has never lived. Right? Despair is always a sign that you're not numb. That's what we love about Beckett. That's what we love about Chekhov. You look despair in the face, you wrestle with it the way Jacob wrestled with that angel of death in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. You come up with a new name, God wrestler Israel. Come up with new energy, new vision, so that the very wrestling with despair, or in Beckett's case, the song of despair, allows you to wrestle with despair but not allow despair to have the last word. That's Didi and Gogo and waiting for Godot. That's why we love Beckett. He takes you right to the bleakness, but that laughter of Didi and Gogo can still be heard and echoed down to the quarters of time. Thank you, Brother Sam Beckett. You see what I mean? He's not denying it, but this is not Disneyland. I mean, America's more tired to Disneyland. Oh, it's Peter Pan, forever young, no death, no time, no history, no despair, no dread. Stay on Main Street, Disney World in Orlando and find how you gonna come to terms with catastrophe when it's time to leave the park? <laughs> they gonna shut down the lights on you. They shut down the lights. Gotta go now, gotta go now. You see what I mean? But thank God for you and Brother Marshall though. Key word was love. Absolutely, key word is love. Indeed, I know we're going, what, what you do is, how best to proceed, the last, last 40 seconds, is that all right? Yeah. One, two, three, four. And it's gonna be real quick. Thank you so much, my dear sister. Hi, um, I have a philosophical question that I want to ask on street level more concretely. Sure. And um, that street level, that's a reference to Marie Lagones' work. But anyway, I'm wondering where resistance comes from in the psychology, in the ontology, in the experience, in the flesh of the individual. Where do you think resistance comes from? Ooh, a lot of different places. A lot of different places, you know. Um, Wounded flesh, scarred bodies, violated dignity, uh, various attacks on community, uh, trashing of traditions, all of these are those wounded moments. You know, Isaiah Berlin talks about this wounded humanity that responds in various ways. But keep in mind, resistance is ideologically promiscuous, which is to say it could be right-wing resistance, it could be left-wing resistance. We gotta make sure that resistance has a spiritual and moral content that's tied to poor and working people. Because right-wing has its own forms of resistance. You see, Hitler was responding to what? The wound of Germany resulting from World War I. You see, right-wing Zionist thinkers like Brother Nathan Yahoo. Not to be confused with Albert Einstein, not to be confused with Judah Magnus, not to be confused with our Haka Ham. The unbelievable, undeniable woundedness of our precious Jewish brothers and sisters that says we will trust no one other than the American Empire. <laughs> and they got good grounds for not trusting anybody because our precious Jewish brothers and sisters have been out there all by themselves too often for 2,000 years. But there's a right wing respond to that wound, right? These Palestinians, these Arabs, and so forth and so on, are to be contained, their land taken, and so forth and so on. Or with Albert Einstein, as Jewish, as Jabotinsky, secular, Princetonian, says we must learn how to coexist in the name of the best of the Jewish people, you see but the wound is still there. So resistance comes from a number of different ways in which people are wrestling with their wounds and scars. Uh, that, that's the beginning of an answer to that very difficult question. We just have to make sure it's got more on spiritual high ground. That's the key. Def Ooh, look like I keep saying it's gonna be a short answer and these questions are so good that it's hard. Go right ahead, my dear sister. <laughs> um, hi, I'm a graduate student. Um, I study uh, the impact of neoliberalism on social movements. Ooh, yeah. um, and I've, one of the things that I've been studying a lot lately is um, how sort of the neoliberal world in which we exist um, f makes the desire for social movements to be about um, becoming part of like the American uh, 
empire, like the sense of citizenship, meaning like we can also be the oppressors. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about what sort of resistance organizations, what social movements um, are doing it right, that are like critiquing the system as opposed to just trying to gain access to it. Oh, and they thank you so much. We can't wait to read your dissertation. <laughs> But you know the classic written by our dear brother Sag Van Berkovich, Canadian who came to America to teach us much about ourselves. He wrote a classic in 1978 called The American Jeremiad. It goes all the way back to the Puritans who engage in forms of prophetic criticism that move between declension on the one hand and affirmation on the other. So you posit a city on the hill that's failed, you critique that city in its real form, but you don't interrogate what that ideal is. And if you don't interrogate what that ideal is, then you act as if, lo and behold, when America took off, somehow it was not worthy of serious interrogation. And so you end up moving between either a conservatism or a neoliberalism, a very constrained, truncated discourse. But if we tell the truth about America, as precious as our democratic efforts have been, it began as a settler colonial enterprise. It was a business before it was a democratic experiment before it became a revolutionary effort to push back George III. It enslaved all of these, 22% of its inhabitants in 1770. Women couldn't vote, patriarchal households, white men without property could not vote. So you don't go back to the true America, let's interrogate what it was then, and look, what are the conditions for the possibility of that? You wouldn't have it without the land, you wouldn't have it without the slavery, you wouldn't have it without the patriarchy. Does that mean America, is reduced to slavery and patriarchy and class exploitation? Not at all, because there's always been voices of all colors, critical of the treatment of indigenous peoples, critical of the enslaved people, not just black folk and red folk. Lydia Maria Child's appeal in favor of the class of Americans called Africans, responding to David Walker's appeal in 1829. Black man, white woman, same moral spiritual discourse. So in that sense, these days, we swing between neoliberalism on the one hand and even further right conservative, and now we've got this neo-fascist movement that's escalating every day. But we've got to shatter that narrow framework. That's why talking about empire, talking about white supremacy, talking about patriarchy is very, very important. That's one of the reasons why I'm critical again of my dear brother Coates, because he, he, he's got Tremendous talent, but he tends to talk about white supremacy independent of empire, independent of class. So it's never been all black people and all white people. That does not exist. There's a whole lot of different kind of white brothers and sisters. And if people can't tell the difference between a radical Irish sister and a was brother, in the struggles of 800 years of colonialism of the Irish and the British, then you begin to homogenize. And the last thing you need to do in a crisis is homogenize because you disempower people. You see, there's no category that ever fully imprisons any of us. We're human beings who can choose. See, John Brown chose to love black people more than many black people loved themselves. That's why he gave his life. See what I mean? But unpopular. We can go on and on. And so that crucial thing when we talk about the narrow alternatives and then freeing people up to be courageous and have fortitude, you've got to be able to ensure that your categories are not so broad, so global, and so, so homogenizing that you end up disempowering people with a fatalism which is the last thing we need these days. We got two more quickly and then... Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, my dear. So good luck on your dissertation, too. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Hi, thanks for being with us, Dr. West. No, thank you, my brother. Um, so my question is, how important is net neutrality to the struggle against injustice? And will you be taking part in the nationwide protests on December 7th? Well, it's very important because you can imagine when you have a public square that's driven by the market principles, when you have a public square in which oligopolies, monopolies shape the very ways in which that public square is presented to the folk, and those oligopolies and monopolies themselves are not publicly accountable in any substantive way, that's a real danger, especially for marginal voices. 
especially for marginal voices, Black Agenda Report, for example, Counterpunch, and other very important voices, the Chris Hedges of our day, and the, the Mumia Blue Jamal's, and the uh, Henry Giraud's, and we can go on and on. Their voices easily pushed to the margin. And then, of course, you know, we got the one and only Noam Chomsky, not that he has monopoly on truth, but he's got some important truths to tell, to push his voice to the margins. Very dangerous thing at this moment. Why? Because the only way you end up dealing with significant renewal is when you have the courage to confront your underside. And if you have a public square that pushes crucial voices to the margins and rendering them almost invisible, then we're in even deeper, uh, we have a deeper problem than we had before. So no, I'll be very much supportive of that and a part of that indeed, indeed. Thanks so much. Last, last, brother. Last question. Thanks so much. That was a cool answer. I'm, I'm glad he asked it. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt um, from West Virginia. From West Virginia. Yeah. Thank you, brother Skip Gates. That's dynamite. <laughs> Bill Withers, too. But go right ahead. Yeah, Bill Withers. Yeah. Oh, you got some folk coming out of West Virginia, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, as, a, as a man who said uh, that he could not save himself, but, but you said Christ saved you, or, or Jesus saved you earlier. Um, do you find a uniqueness there in, in the story of, I guess, in Genesis, God promising to save Adam and Eve and humanity and, and Abraham walking between the fire and then in the letters to Corinth, Jesus making all things new? How does that speak to race? Um, I, I keep thinking mm. of the Christian Christmas song, pre-abolition, that it says, yes. chains shall he break for the slave is now our brother, um, written by white folk. Um, how does, how does Christ fit into race and, and the tension and the strife that we see? Yeah, no, I appreciate that last question. I'm glad this is the last one, though, brother, because, uh, ooh, we need time to deal with these queries. First, let me just couch it in very public secular language that given all the fear that we have in the world, Oftentimes, love is the only thing that can break that fear. I mean, love is a form of learning how to die. So that when you undergo a love experience, you can fall in love with the work of Picasso. You can fall in love with another person. You fall in love with beauty that turns your world upside down. So there's a resurrectionary quality to it. What was once dead comes alive. You see? So you've been in love before? You know what it was like before you were in love? And you know what it was like after you were in love? You learned how to die, that your isolated narcissistic self was attacked with that rush of love. And you were turned upside down, you walked around at least for a while with a smile on your face. Because Sappho has taught us about bittersweet, right? Bittersweet is usually waiting for us in the love. But that's only because you love so much, you care so much. And in the Christian story, it's precisely that death in the, at the feet of the Roman Empire, of a hated people, of Jewish people, long histories of enslavement and devaluing that unleashes these love drops, and that's all they are. They're love drops at the feet of the cross that say that this empire, this hatred, this contempt tries to suffocate and snuff out all of the possibilities of love, and all you get are these little love drops at the bottom of that cross that has the capacity to turn your world upside down, just like falling in love in other forms. And so for those Christians like myself, who were already living the life of a living dead as a gangster, underwent a fundamental transformation that can never be denied. Never denied. That's what the old folk meant when they said they give you a joy the world can't give you and the world can't take away. You see what I mean? Same is true when you fall in love. Even if I talked to you 15 years ago and you're not with the same person, I was gonna say, brother, if that love was real, I know it turned you around. You just had problems along the way and changed your mind because you never forget it, you see. And that's what it is to fall in love with the life of the mind. That's the difference between an intellectual and an academic. The academic goes professional. 
The intellectual got love. They can't give it up. And if they don't wrestle with that love, the rocks are going to shout. They're going to cry out. You see? That's the ways in which love and death are so intertwined. And for people who've been taught to hate themselves, like black people, it's no accident that we've taught the world so much about how to love the best of us. Because it was the only way we can come to terms with the depths of the hatred, the intensity of the hatred for 400 years, including this very moment in this empire. And when you really want those death wrestlings and those love drops, that's when you go to Luther Vandross. That's when you go to Erica Badu. That's where you go to Kendrick Lamar. You listen to the love drops coming through that brother's chains. Not just the orality that's kinetic, but the spirituality that is tear soaked and blood stained. Because in the end, there is no love without death. That's what's wrong with Disneyland. It's magnificent, it's fun, but there's no life where there is no death. That's the inside of Jerusalem. That's the inside of Socrates and Plato. Right. To love, to philosophize is to learn how to die. That's Montaigne tied to Plato, right? And that learning how to die means you come up with unbelievable new possibilities. Your world turned upside down. You're driven by something deeper than you. And yet your physical death is still waiting for us. Our bodies will be, will have experience of extinction just like our dear brother Crothers. Is that his name? The great, the great brother Crothers, pastor of this church. But thank you so much for that. And we'll have a little time for signing. You all take good care. Thank you for beacon again. Thank you for beacon. Thank you for brother, our dear brother Adam Dyer, Reverend Adam Dyer.